If you're a sole proprietor, when is it right to jump to an LLC? Uh, this is one of my most requested interviews, and I interviewed John Augustus Kim, who's a tax attorney, to answer this question. Now, this is an audio-only interview, and the audio was a little bit rough, but the information was so important that I wanted to release it as soon as possible and get it out to you. Now, I'm putting this here even though it's an audio-only experience. So after, <laughs> after this, after I'm done talking, I'm going to roll the interview with just a, a, a single shot. And so if you want this information, you can either listen to it on your podcast app or else you can just, if you want to listen to it, just keep playing this video while you go off and cook dinner, uh, work out, or do whatever you want to do. So if you're interested in learning about your business structure, whether it's a sole proprietorship or when you should go to an LLC or the advantages of being taxed as an S-Corp, then listen on. What is the difference between a sole proprietorship and an LLC? And more importantly, when should you consider one over the other as your business structure? Hello, Reptile Entrepreneurs. This is your host, Bill Strand. And today I come to you with one of the most asked for interviews by you listeners. And you better believe I listen to your requests. The whole mission behind this podcast is to help you be successful. To answer the LLC question, I have on John Augustus Kim, a tax attorney that not only specializes in business structure and tax issues, but has experience with clients in the reptile community. So he understands our situation. We end up having multiple sources of income and for breeders, our inventory just appears out of nowhere. So it doesn't hurt to have someone who knows the lay of the land. Now, I want to beg your forgiveness on one point. The audio for this interview ended up having some distortion to it. There would be a great delay if I re-recorded it. So I considered the immense value of this interview and I decided I wanted to get the information out there. So please be understanding as you listen. But I promise that the information is worth it. Just the part where John talks about the inflection point where sole proprietor self-employment tax matches the LLC annual fee gives you a solid turning point as to when you should consider the change. Honestly, I listened to this three times to absorb the nuances, because how the different entities are taxed is not easily digestible on the first pass. Luckily, this can be replayed, and luckily there are people like John who do this for a living and are available to help keep things straight. I know of John's capabilities because he's been there for me to figure out Dragon Strand, my breeding income, and various affiliate income sources. Taxes are taxes, but I've learned not to underestimate the advantage of working with someone who understands my business. So if you are starting a business, or are wondering if you should do a business structure change, this episode is for you. Hello, Reptile Entrepreneurs. This is your host, Bill Strand. And today I am with John Kim because we are going to be discussing something that affects us all, and that is our tax status and our business configuration. Uh, John, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you so much, Bill. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. Well, let's go ahead and start off with just uh, what you do. Uh, I know you do taxes, but your uh, your uh, capabilities are so much more. Uh, what is it you do? Uh, well, I guess uh, in a nutshell, uh, you know, by uh, training, I'm a CPA and I'm an attorney. Probably most of my work that I do, uh, you know, involves tax to some extent, um, anywhere from uh, tax preparation and tax consulting, uh, which is uh, what I do for uh, Bill. And mm -hmm. uh, I also do uh, accounting and monthly bookkeeping. You know, if uh, you uh, happen to be audited by the IRS, I also uh, help you out in those situations as well. Uh, help out with collection matters. If you owe the IRS, you know, you've heard the commercials. If you owe the IRS 10000 mm -hmm. or more, I do that kind of stuff. And then sort of going more towards the legal front, uh, I do a lot of estate planning, which involves wills and trusts and power of attorneys, things like that. Also uh, do a lot of uh, trust administration, which is basically helping people out like after they die. Somewhere along the way, I also do this uh, uh, business setup. And I think that kind of hits uh, directly on what your uh, topic is today. And uh, essentially that's helping businesses, essentially people 
uh, set up their business and find the appropriate entity uh, to fit their business. The reason why I specifically chose uh, John for this uh, interview is because I know he's familiar with the reptile community. Uh, I know I'm not the only one in the community who he uh, serves. Uh, of course, he can't talk about other clients, but I, I, I can say that, yes, he, uh, he does my taxes. And uh, he is familiar with the unique uh, parts, uh, the unique status that we as reptile people bring to the uh, the IRS. And yeah, that's uh, absolutely, um, you know, it's been a, a great experience and definitely a learning experience uh, working with Bill. And uh, I know uh, uh, there's a lot of sort of uh, unique uh, issues to the, uh, uh, you know, breeder community. Uh, so yeah, Bill, it's not just you that struggles with uh, inventory and things like that. It's all of us. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a lot of fun because as as breeders we have inventory that just appears out of nowhere, sure. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we deal with that. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, let's get to uh, we are a breeder. That's a scenario where uh, we we breed things, we sell dry goods, we even get YouTube AdSense, and we're doing it as a hobby. Uh, how does the IRS consider us when we? start off like that sure well i think initially the the key word there is is hobby and you know one of the rules to you know be aware of is the the hobby rules and uh, essentially they say that uh, if you're operating a an enterprise and uh, you're sustaining losses year after year uh, i think the rule says maybe three years in a row or five years in a row that in that situation, the IRS can presume that you're a hobby. It doesn't mean that you're by default a hobby, but uh, you would have to basically uh, rebut the IRS's presumption that you're a hobby. And the IRS rationale is that, hey, uh, you're doing this and and you're you know working hard at this, but uh, you're not making any money. In fact, you're you know you're you're paying to do this, and so the IRS believes that well in that situation it's probably not a uh, profit motivated uh, business. And so in that case, the IRS wouldn't allow any deductions against that income and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's kind of adding insult to injury. That's kind of a gut shot. <laughs> and, and, and again, I'm just the messenger. I, you know, I <laughs> but yes, the hobby loss rules are absolutely something to watch out for. And, and you know, again, it's not a... Uh, you know, uh, it doesn't mean that if you have this fact pattern that you're going to be considered a hobby, but that if you do get looked at or, you know, quote unquote audited and the IRS sees a pattern of losses, then, uh, yeah, they'll probably go down the path of uh, trying to disallow the, you know, the expenses uh, on the basis of a hobby loss. All right. So at what point do we become legitimate in the eyes of the IRS and I, I guess at that point become a sole proprietor? Sure. The point is really uh, uh, the point at which you have a profit motive. I mean, that's really the uh, cornerstone of being able to really write anything off for tax purposes is that you have this business and you're trying to make money. And again, the key word is trying. There's nowhere in the code that says you have to make a profit uh, but um, as long as there's a profit motive, then the IRS yeah. considers you a business for tax purposes and you can uh, write off expenses. And probably uh, uh, most people, when they start their business and uh, they start as a sole proprietor, uh, that's uh, probably the simplest uh, way to start a business is to start a sole proprietorship because uh, essentially that's just a, an individual. I mean, it's just a human being. And uh, for tax purposes, it's the same thing. An individual would pay their own taxes like, uh, you know, like you or I would. And uh, they file a 1040 to the IRS. And on that form, uh, there's a page where you report your sole proprietorship activities. It's called a Schedule C. And that's pretty much your, uh, your profit and loss, so to speak, uh, for tax purposes. And whatever the bottom line is on that, 
that is what you're going to pay income tax on. And so uh, sole proprietorship, uh, absolutely the easiest business to start. Um, there's hardly any startup costs. I mean, all you have to do is, you know, start trying to make money. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, very easy to get set up like that. Okay, so at what point is it worth looking into becoming an LLC or some other business uh, structure? Sure. Well, that's a uh, that's a great question, and I was, you know, thinking about that last night, and it's, you know, I don't think there's one kind of uh, uh, answer that fits all, but I tried to think of some, um, you know, a, a few kind of key factors that might uh, indicate that, well, you might want to start an LLC. I mean, first of all, as far as sole proprietorships, uh, they're taxed on that Schedule C, uh, like we discussed. And for LLCs, uh, there's a special rule that says that if you are a single member, uh, which means a single owner, LLC, then for federal tax purposes, the LLC is completely disregarded, meaning the IRS, it doesn't even see your LLC. It doesn't exist. That's for LLCs that are uh, only have one owner. And so I think that's the case for many, if not most, LLCs. And so what happens there for tax purposes is that your LLC would be taxed on that same Schedule C that your sole proprietorship was taxed on. So for tax purposes, if you started an LLC on your IRS tax return, the only thing that would change is probably the name of your Schedule C business, you know, going from, you know, whatever it's called to, uh, you know, the name of this new LLC you created. Um, so uh, for tax purposes, it really not much changes when you're a single member LLC. But, um, you know, if you are a single member LLC, there could be some uh, reasons to uh, still form a uh, LLC. I'm sorry, if you're a sole proprietor. And I've heard, you know, several, many different reasons really, but they go anywhere from, you know, kind of aesthetic reasons like, uh, you know, you want to kind of look more official. So instead of, you know, having just uh, your name as the business, you want to, mm -hmm. you know, have like a real business name. And so that could be one reason why you want to start an LLC, but um, you may not have to. I mean, if you just want a business name, you can easily uh, create a, fi a fictitious business name with the county. Uh, you know, a lot of people, they call them DBAs. You know, a lot cheaper to do that than start an LLC. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, so that's one reason people might want to start an LLC is just they, they want to they want a business entity they want to look like a you know like a, a company or whatever mm -hmm. another big reason is uh, I'm sure we've all thought about it is uh, liability protection I mean that's really the reason why LLCs exist uh, they're relatively new entities in the law you know probably they were started in most states uh, probably in the 60s or, or later, you know, 70s. But as far as uh, that liability protection, LLC, that's another great reason to start it. Okay. And then you get into, well, what if you're more than just one owner? What if you have a business partner? So I think that's kind of the line where things get a little bit more, I don't want to say complicated, but, you know, I'll say complicated. Uh, when you have more than one owner, that's when things become more important. You want to have a decent set of books and records, and you probably might want to start an LLC. You know, if anything, because with an LLC, one of the things that you need is a uh, an operating agreement. It's basically a contract. So whoever you want to partner up with, they would have to sign this contract with you. And that would be the operating agreement which is the most important document for an LLC. It's the governing document. Okay. So uh, multiple owners would be a reason as well okay. to start an LLC. Say we decide we want to start an LLC. How do you do that? You register with the state, but then do you just all just say, okay, everything I've got is now part of the LLC? Is it that Pretty simple? much. I mean, pretty much at least it should feel that simple. 
and that's pretty much what you do. Uh, as far as the steps, um, mechanically, it's very easy to start an LLC. You can go to the uh, Secretary of State website uh, and then click on the Business Entities tab, and uh, you can search for different LLCs that exist right now. And you just type in an LLC name basically to see if it exists. And if it doesn't, that's great. Then you can file what's called Articles of Organization. And all these forms are right there on the LLC website, uh, the uh, Secretary of State website. So you file this uh, Articles of Organization. It's like one page. You just need the LLC name and you know address and uh, not much info at all. And then uh, you mail the piece of paper in with a check for $70. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, probably within a few weeks, you'll get a letter back that says, Hey, welcome to California. You're an LLC. Um, don't forget to file your LLC taxes each year and pay $800. <laughs> but it's, it's really that simple to mechanically start an LLC and basically be on the California LLC website. Now, in the background, uh, somebody needs to prepare all the organic documents the governing documents like the operating agreement, the uh, you know the stock certificates. It's not called stock; they're, they're membership units. But um, you know, a, a list of all the uh, uh, members and addresses. So there's there's some you know a handful of documents that have to be prepared. But uh, that's what I do. Uh, I can absolutely help with that. But yeah, LLC. It's very easy to set up. It's uh, in California. You have to pay eight hundred dollars per year. Uh, to California no matter what. It's like a, a minimum tax. And even if you don't make any money, you still have to pay 800. It's the kind of the tax that you pay to California for the privilege of doing business in California. That includes the liability protection. And do and you know how similar it is to sta other states within the United States? Uh, yeah. Um, as far as the LLC itself, it's going to be... Uh, essentially the same no matter what state uh, you go to i think all states have an llc statute now and so yeah any state that has an llc statute uh it, it's going to be treated the same as an llc in some other state i mean what you're basically getting is you're being treated like a corporation as far as liability protection is concerned so uh, one of the beautiful things about LLCs is that you get that liability protection, but typically in most states, there's not a real burdensome uh, maintenance requirement each year. The best example is a corporation. Typically, uh, a corporation is another type of tax uh, business entity. It's like an LLC, it's an entity, but for a corporation, it's, uh, it's a little bit different. So really, you know, one of the beautiful things about LLCs is that they're like C corporations in that they offer that liability protection, but with an LLC, there's a much less burdensome record keeping requirement. The best example is uh, like corporations, uh, most states, they'll require corporations to do a lot of annual documentation, uh, meaning like, um, each year you have to do your annual corporate minutes and it's not complicated it's not difficult but you know you're supposed to do it each year um, probably because uh, the main reason is um, I would think is you don't want anyone to quote unquote pierce the corporate veil and that's why at least probably a huge reason why corporations need to keep up their books so that someone doesn't try to sue the the shareholders of the corporation and one very common way they do that is by piercing the corporate veil. And one way they can pierce the corporate veil is by saying that, hey, this corporation is not maintaining their annual corporate books. They're not doing their annual meetings. They're not keeping their annual notes. By yeah. contrast, LLCs, at least in California and you know the states I've looked at, they don't have that strict record keeping requirement. It's almost like you get the best of both worlds. You get the liability protection, but you don't have to do all that annual meeting minutes and stuff like that. Well, let's talk about what liability protection is. Uh, what does that mean for us? Absolutely. So, I don't know, I guess uh, 
what comes to mind is slip and fall. Maybe that's a bad example, but it's you have a business and you interact with other people, customers, vendors, third parties. And during the course of your uh, business dealings, uh, one of those parties you know, gets upset with something that you did and they demand something of you. And, and of course, you're not going to you know, just give it to them. And so uh, this other party, they actually you know, file a, a court document that says that, okay, now you have to go through this process, you know, this court process to hash this thing out. And the liability protection is that as long as this dispute arose during your LLC business, then that person can not go after your personal assets. They can only go after the LLC, the assets that are inside the LLC. So, uh, and that's the classic liability protection, uh, very similar to the corporate uh, liability protection. So it's like a kind of an invisible shield, like, hey, okay. this is where the buck stops. You know, this is my personal bank account. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can't go after that. Okay. All right. So at this point, let's play a scenario and we'll take the situation of uh, somebody who is uh, very common, is a breeder. So we breed uh, sure. bearded dragons. And then uh, we sell some dry goods and maybe we, we go on YouTube, we create a channel and we get some ad revenue from YouTube. Sure. Uh, let's go through a maturing of that process. We'll start off at the beginning. Okay. So he's a hobbyist, but money is coming in. Let's just uh, do a timeline as to how we grow and at what point we need, uh, we get to the point where we need a structure, we need a uh, tax services. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, this is kind of going just sort of uh, off the cuff, but I, I think okay. I got a good example. You start this business and you start you know, working at it. You start generating revenue. Basically, you start needing a bank account. As far as the, uh, the business income, you have the revenue. And I think that once the revenue reaches, I would say $50,000 in revenue, then you should at least consider a business entity. And the reason why that number uh, is significant for me, and we haven't really talked about S-Corps very much, but I'm going to at least mention it here because um, okay. there's something really cool you can do uh, as an LLC in the tax code, which is uh, if you're an LLC, you can elect to be converted uh, to an S-Corp. But let me back up one step and let me just define exactly what the heck is an S-Corp in the first yes. place. Everybody's heard the word and it's... You know, we almost feel like we know what it is. Um, <clears throat> but I have a feeling that most of us um, might be wrong uh, if this was a test question. And an S-corporation only exists in the IRS tax code. So, uh, like, one funny question is, um, and it's not a big deal. I don't think it's going to affect any day-to-day -day business operations, but it's just kind of the nomenclature because... You know, an S-Corp, again, it's only this fictional entity in the IRS tax code. It's not even an entity, is what I'm trying to say. You know, on a lot of uh, business documents, they might ask, you know, my clients or whoever, uh, uh, oh, well, what kind of business entity do you have? And one of the answer choices might even say S-Corp. But really, I mean, the, the business entity uh, is different than, I guess, just because you're an S-Corp, that doesn't mean your corporation or LLC or uh, anything like that. It's, you could be an LLC, you could be a C Corp, and then on your tax return, you can tell the IRS, I'd like you to tax me like I'm an S Corp. Oh, okay. And what's the advantage there? This is a very powerful tool, which basically says that we can just tell the IRS to tax me as an S Corp. It's very simple. So. You can be taxed like an S-Corp without even starting a corporation or anything like that. You can start an LLC and then somewhere down the line uh, can be ta converted to an S-Corp for tax purposes. And so the and reason why... What does that give yes. us? Yes. So I, I knew you were going to ask, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> so I, that's where the $50,000 uh, number uh, comes to mind because for California, for S-Corp purposes, and this is... You know, I'm sort of jumping to another topic, too, is, okay, what's the difference between LLC and an S-Corp? 
And the tax difference, it really comes down to self-employment tax. So if you're wondering, well, should I start an LLC or should I you know, be an S-Corp for tax purposes? And that's where this one key factor is this payroll tax versus uh, self-employment tax, I guess call it issue. How this works is that when you're a sole proprietor or a single member LLC, then you file your taxes on that Schedule C uh, that we discussed. And whatever that bottom line is, you pay income tax on that, which is pretty obvious. But what's maybe not so obvious is that there's another tax we pay on that bottom line. It's called self-employment tax. And it hurts because a lot of us don't expect that extra 15% tax. Agreed. <laughs> and uh, right, yes, I know Bill. Under- yes. <laughs> But uh, that self-employment tax is what we can kind of um, sort of control if we convert to an S-Corp. And so, you know, how I look at that is that $50,000 number. For California, an S-Corporation is, uh, you know, taxed on the bottom line, just like your Schedule C, which means, you know, your income minus your expenses. And so, uh, you know, that tax is... I believe 1.5%. So if your S corporation had a net income, like your bottom line was 50,000, then you'd have to pay 1.5% of that to California as your, uh, you know, like your S corp tax. And, uh, but you also have to pay $800 to California no matter what. Yes. And so what I'm saying is, that $800 is equivalent to about $53,333 of <laughs> Schedule C income. I see. Okay. So when you get to... Once you go beyond that, it's like, hey, let's consider converting to an S-Corp because with an S-Corp, that net income bottom line does not have to pay that 15% self-employment tax. But let me tell you, the IRS knows that and they hate it. So they make you pay yourself a W-2 wage if you're an S corporation. That's how they make you pay that like self-employment tax in the form of payroll tax, but it's really the same thing. But see, you can control that somewhat, right? You don't have to pay yourself a W-2 in the amount of like your whole bottom line. And that's why I wanted to kind of mention the S corp as a consideration as well. Liability protection, I mean, it's gonna be the same, you know, no matter your LLC or corporation, you know, LLC, definitely easier maintenance requirements. Um, now, LLC, for the LLC tax, it's different than the California S-Corp tax because the LLC tax is based on your top number, your gross revenue, like before expenses. Of course, it's not as high as 1.5%, but it's still, I can't remember, is it 0.9%? But the LLC tax is based on your gross receipts without including any expenses. However, the S-Corp tax for California is based on your bottom line, just like your you know, sole proprietorship, um, but it's a different rate, 1.5%. So uh, as far as the timeline, Bill, I think $50,000 net income, or you know, that's kind of a significant number for me to, you know, as far as a milestone to, to where you could consider you know, another entity or a, you know, LLC setup or corporate setup. Um, Definitely in the timeline, whenever you think of bringing somebody else on board, I would say even if they're your spouse, Mm -hmm. um, you know, think about setting up an LLC so you guys can have a contract because, uh, you know, without a a decent contract, it's uh, things can go south real fast. I mean, think about how difficult it is to maintain marriages in California. And then now you want to, you know, try and maintain a business relationship with somebody else. Yeah, make sure you get it on paper in the form of an LLC operating agreement. Let's see, timeline. And also, you know, the, the more income you start making, um, or even the more transaction you start having, the more important your accounting becomes. Mm-hmm. And definitely if you bring somebody else on so that it's more than one owner, your accounting becomes critical. Uh, let me think, what else as far as timeline? I mean, I think as, as far as the timeline to kind of set up the business, get started, move in, and um, consider setting up an LLC. I, I think kind of that 50,000 threshold is probably a good benchmark. And that's gross revenue? Um, well, gross revenue would be, you know, 
that wouldn't hurt but i would say definitely by the time your net income okay. is you know fifty thousand, then hey talk to you know talk to your cpa talk to me um we can analyze things see what kind of entity would be appropriate yeah i've uh just just from this last conversation, it reminds me why I'm glad that there are people like you. Oh, gosh, uh, Bill, you're there. awesome. This is, you know, like I mentioned, I've never done these. I don't even know what to call it, like a podcast. I don't know what it's called. Like, <laughs> this is so great. Let me mention this, too. Oh, this is hugely important. LLC, one of the most beautiful things, especially or maybe only if you are a multiple owner, like if you have a partner and stuff. One of the, maybe the most beautiful thing about the LLC is that for multiple owner LLCs, that offers the most flexibility in allocating uh, your profits and losses and distributions. And I know it's, it's, um, it sounds simple, but it, that's a huge statement right there. That's probably the pivotal reason most people convert to an LLC is that it's the most flexible way to allocate profits and distributions. As corporation, you do not have that flexibility. You have to split everything according to ownership percentage. Even if your partner didn't do any work during the year and they just sat around, <laughs> you still have to <laughs> split things, you know, like that. But LLC is different. And I think uh, that's something I definitely want to mention. Now, John, if there are People in the uh, the reptile community right now thinking about setting up a business. Uh, are you available for taking on new clients? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, thankfully, I'm at least uh, good at emails and pretty much everything but this podcast stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, it's absolutely I'm available. Um, and what's the best way to contact you? Uh, email or, uh, or my phone number. Um, those are my two uh, direct access routes. Okay, listeners, I'm going to be having that contact information in the show notes at reptileentrepreneur.com if you are interested in uh, getting some help from someone who understands our unique situation. John, I want to thank you so very much for coming on and sharing this information. Well, this was so fun, Bill. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, I can't wait to uh, be here again. So now, would you say you understand business structure and the corporations and LLCs? <laughs> now, if only the IRS would freeze and not change the tax code. Unfortunately, I fear we can only count on annual changes to continue. But this episode should give you an idea of what to consider with your business structure. If you are interested in getting some professional help with your unique situation, then you are welcome to contact John at johnkim at augustusfirm.com. Nothing fancy in there. John is J-O-H-N. Kim is K-I-M. And Augustus is August with a U.S. attached. Of course, I will have that and his phone number linked in the show notes for this episode on reptileentrepreneur.com. I knew that creating a podcast on helping entrepreneurs get started would have no end to subjects we need to touch on. And narrowing my topic to a niche market like reptiles only increases the complexity and coolness of the episodes I can make. But far from complaining, I am loving the ability to dive deep into these topics and get to know members of our community that are making it happen. And you know how I end my podcast with the saying, take care of yourself and take care of our reptile community? There is a lot packed into that statement. You cannot take care of the reptile community unless you are strong yourself. Being strong is not being selfish in a bad way. Strengthening yourself is the only way that your efforts can be strengthening to the community instead of leeching from it. Yes, I know it's easy for people to abuse that and become a parasite on the community. But as entrepreneurs, in the beginning, I see more people needing to take better care of themselves, business-wise, than the other way around. Perhaps I will have some mid-level company management episodes, but right now, I'm going to focus on you as a startup entrepreneur. And I want you to take care of yourself so you can be strong for the reptile community and be part of us building a solid society. This is Bill Strand signing off. I will see you next time.